lights go off before we come out, the switch gets turned on. We come out where, like, I change. It's kind of like the inner demons come out, and then off stage, like, you're a completely different person. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, I'm going to go shut the stage lights. This was kind of like therapy for us when we started, and it still is. You know, if I wasn't in the band with these four other guys, I definitely wouldn't do it. This band has a way of saving lives, you know, and it, it keeps us alive. We're definitely a band that wants to save your life. What does your shirt, shirt say, dude? MCR saved my life. That's the fucking real point of all this. First time it saved my life was when I was super depressed. And on a lot of antidepressants, and I wasn't going to do anything with my life. The second time it saved my life was when I was an alcoholic and depressed and suicidal. I never said I'd lie and wait forever. So it saved my life and, and it's there to save other people's lives. I wanted to make music that impacted people's lives. I think what we get to do together, the music that we create together is one of a kind and it's just really special. We all love to play, but that's really not why we all started this. You know, it wasn't because we loved to play. It's because we had a purpose. The message we've always, we've always been pretty adamant or vocal about our message. Just to know that it's okay to be messed up because there's five dudes that are just as messed up as you and we've overcome that in order to do what we do. The strengths of this band are what, to me, the combination of what Gerard does against what the guitars are doing and the vision that they have for their music and the fact that every time they do a video or they do the, they did the record it has a coherent vision the band definitely has a, a lot of this you know five distinct personalities what's up dude mikey i remember when he was a baby we've always been really close i think mikey keeps us from keeps losing us our minds yeah. mikey! 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 in having him out it's kind of like he's everybody's kid brother oh! Oh! I try, to, I try to be the, the spiritual advisor for the band. He inspires me in so many ways. He is so talented. I think sometimes he doesn't quite realize how special or talented he is. Frank, you know, he really plays with all his heart. You know, when he plays, he really looks like, you know, he's putting every single ounce of his body and soul into that performance. I get hurt every fucking day. I'm an idiot. The worst was when I broke my toes. Did you get kicked in the balls by someone named Frankie? You kicked him hard. It just hurt. I didn't care, but I was wondering. I was wondering what he was doing over there in the first place. I was like, Yo, he's way over here. And then when he kicked me in the balls, I was like, What did I do? Well, how would you consider me? I'm so fucked up. The quiet genius. Yeah, mastermind. Mastermind. The man with the plan. The man with the plan. Ray Toro. It's an honor to play Ray Toro. I think he's truly like a genius. He cares so much about music and not about being famous or being a rock star. I'm kind of bummed that I didn't hang out more with people because I was too busy being a complete and utter hermit in the back. A man obsessed is what I've been Bob is such an amazing person. Him and, and Toro are the hardest working people I've ever met. Bob is... Muscle. The muscle. The Bob, muscle. ow! Bob, my head! Are you gonna get out? <laughs> are you gonna get out? Bob will tell you when you're wrong. Stop. Just come on in. Stop. Bob is definitely gonna take no shit. He doesn't take, doesn't take, doesn't take any no shit. shit from anybody. Stupid fuck, get out of way from me. And he teaches us all never to take any shit. I've fallen into him and almost killed him a few times, and he doesn't ever get mad at me. It's so hard not to push off the drop. <laughs> you know, if there's a god, I thank him every day for having bringing us Bob. Gerard. He's always been my older brother. And so not only that, he's also my best friend. Gerard is sort of the, you know, slightly off-center, you know, leader, I guess. I don't know, he's like a genius, you know? He's now, like, looked up to by hundreds of thousands of kids. 
as like a cult icon. I'm really proud of him. You guys from New Jersey? No, we're very proud of where we're from. How long have you guys been together? Uh, three years. Yeah. The band is based in New Jersey. New Jersey! Show me what you got! Jersey is like a mecca for music. Because you have millions of people living in this tiny state, and uh, a lot of them make music. And I'm the only one that's not from New Jersey. I'm there a lot, though. So I can deal with these guys. New Jersey! Where we're from is very different from most Jersey bands, which is important to know about us because it's not like a money area. It's a very, it's it's a very dangerous area. It's a very crime-ridden area. Yeah, your parents were not, you know, wouldn't let you go outside of the house after a certain hour because, you know, a week before they found the dead body and you know, the local park that kids go to play in. My mom was just really apprehensive about me and Gerard going out and playing. There's a lot of, you know, shootings, drug-related crimes, murders, things like that, mafia-related crimes. And this is a park called uh, West Hudson Park that's like right around the corner from my house where they found, I think, at least like four or five dead bodies in the, in the pond, like, over the last couple of years, so. So as kids, you, you know, you, you couldn't really go out and play. He calls the mansion not a house but a tomb. I think that's why we're so into like horror movies. The wedding party all collapsed in the room. So send my resignation to the bride and the groom. Yeah, that's the only beam of sunlight that comes into my room. <laughs> Mom, come on, be in my video. So into this thing. That's freaky, that bat. Yeah, that's my uh, grandfather's paperweight. Oh, you got it? Like, wait, I'll show you the shit you have to shoot in here. <laughs> it's so, this is like Jersey. What I had to do, and my brother had to do, was really just create our own kind of space in our heads. And that's why there's such a fantasy element to My Chemical Romance. Like, I drew pictures, I wrote stories, I made stories up, I lied a lot, I, I kind of lived in my head. It's because as children, we had to develop these kind of things to live in because you couldn't really live in the real world as a child. You couldn't go outside and play. I definitely feel like no matter where we go or we tour or stuff like that, like I'm not scared of of the places or the people there or, unless we're in Detroit. I think the only place that actually scared the shit out of me is the Tenderloin. That's because we walked out of a, in San Francisco, walked off the bus in my makeup and costume and this dude across the street in front of a crack house just goes, Better stay on that side of the street, motherfucker. <laughs> I'll knock you out. <laughs> Come on, New Jersey! When I was growing up, my dad worked at the post office. Um, he worked as, I think he worked in like the shipping department. The real story behind me singing is, um, my grandma had a lot to do with it. You know, he was kind of a shy kid when he was, when he was really young and he, he had all these talents that he was afraid to, to, to dwell on because, I mean, you know, he was afraid he was going to get made fun of or he was afraid that he wasn't good enough at them and I mean, one of the abilities was singing and at a young age, he, he started to explore this voice that he had. I changed schools um, when I was a kid. Me and Mikey went to a different public school. And it was fourth grade. It was kind of a, like a new slate. It was really weird, you know? And so I, I thought maybe I'll try things. Like I drew a lot more. I got involved in art, art programs and stuff. And um, there was like this drama club they had. And I said, well, let me just try this. One of the earliest memories of that was we had a school play. They had this production of Peter Pan, which is usually played by a girl, so I don't know how cool this is that I got the part, but I just kind of opened my mouth and was able to sing. Dream of calories. And then my grandma was really excited about it. I wasn't so excited about it. I just kind of, I guess I just wanted to prove myself that I could do it. Then after I got the part, I kind of was stuck into doing it. And he sang, and he was Peter Pan, and he and he nailed it. In the song was called "I Don't Want to Grow Up," and the lyrics are like, "I don't want to grow up, I don't want to grow up, not a penny will I pinch, 
I will never wear a mustache or never grow a mustache or a fraction of an inch. It's just a <laughs> song. It's like a descendant song. Yeah, yeah, it kind of <laughs> does. And uh, she made me this outfit. And it was, it's green tights. Everything I had Bad. built, I had ruined. Because <laughs> I had kind of wanted to escape my old elementary school. So, of course, it's a great idea to play fucking Peter Pan your first year, right? In a new school. So, after that experience, the drama teacher was really into my voice and she would always get me to sing stuff for school functions and stuff and then I, I, as soon as I hit middle school, middle school is kind of the point where you're like wait a minute I used to hang out with like all these kids and we used to all be friends and now it's all about popularity. He kind of shied away from it for a long time because it's like you know just like awkwardness of growing up. I was like well I don't want to be this weird singer kid anymore you know and I was into a lot of other stuff like I was into comic books and Iron Maiden and it just wasn't my thing, so I gave, I kind of turned my back on it. And then I, I, ch I thought I was going to be in a rock band and play guitar. He plays like a little bit. I wasn't very good. I mean, he's not good enough to, you know, to play live, I think, but he's good enough where he can come up with really interesting riffs. I joined this band I was really psyched on. I couldn't play Sweet Home of Alabama on guitar, and I got kicked out. In the middle of a gunfight, in the center of a restaurant, they say, come with your arms raised high. Well, they're never gonna get me. Well, I can pull it through flock of dogs. Some of the bands and artists that have had a big effect on our music, um, pretty varied, um, at least from, from my end. I was kind of introduced into, you know, introduced to music through my older brother. Um, you know, he was listening to, you know, Zeppelin, The Doors, and The Who, and, you know, tons of stuff like that. He was also into, you know, metal, which was cool. And, um, you know, he got me listening to Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, um, Molly Hatchet. Growing up, Mean Gerard had always traded, uh, at the time, I guess it was tapes, um, of bands that we'd both been really into it. it was for me first it was Iron Maiden I got into Iron Maiden and that changed everything me and him were both obsessed with Iron Maiden it gave me that theater influence and then another theater-esque band but the first punk rap, punk band I was ever into was the Misfits you know it was a lot of punk bands the Misfits the yeah. Misfits are so important in New Jersey because like they're from Lodi which is near us and but they were legends in Jersey, and like you still felt it to this to this day. You could still feel it if you're in Jersey, like the Misfits own New Jersey. So in, in liking punk rock and loving it, I found Black Flag. Of course, Black Flag. Like just listening to Break In play. Growing up, like I didn't want to be uh, Van Halen. I wanted to be Break In. Black Flag was the band that got me obsessed for some reason with the concept of revenge, and I think that <clears throat> I was obsessed with revenge because in high school I was such an outcast and I was always fantasizing and I had these like revenge fantasies. And there was a feeling behind it, there was, there was this noise and, and this angst and, uh, and you felt that. So there was always going to be an element of punk in my chem that just this fast, aggressive, beautiful stuff. And early on, me and Gerard had this, this crazy fascination with two people, and it was Glenn Danzig and, and Morrissey. Then came the Smiths, and that was a huge, impactful band on us. And his storytelling, his lyrics, how bleak it was in contrast to how pop it was. Who's going to see Morrissey tomorrow here? Fuck yeah, dude, what, like 10 of you? Yeah, man, but talking about starting a band like what what would be like an ideal band <clears throat> that we'd want to listen to and, and we always said like wouldn't a band be great if it was like Morrissey were in the Misfits and I was like man that'd be such a kick-ass band and we should really try it someday. You are fucking incredible! As far 
that's how we all met. Um, I met Mikey and Gerard. Just a couple of years after I graduated, uh, I graduated high school. Um, I met them through uh, a mutual friend of mine, Sean. He went to school with with some guy named Sean Dillon. I met Ray Toro through a friend in art school. I had met him, and we were, you know, we were all just kind of all into the same stuff, like comic books, uh, horror movies, and music. Did you guys hit it off right away? Like, the... yeah, yeah, we all came from. It was a, you know, it was a very quick friendship with everybody. I remember the first time I think I met you was at this diner. I just remember the one thing I remembered about him the first time I met him was the way he wore his glasses. They were at the end of my nose. Yeah, he wore them at the very end of his nose and he kept his head up like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would look through his glasses like this. <laughs> The most yeah. bizarre thing, and I just thought it was just this really weird kid. I was actually a little closer to Mikey mm -hmm. um, than Gerard. Yeah, and, and Gerard was, you know, kind of this like sort of introverted uh, artist, ne never really left the house. Gerard kind of like, over the years of me knowing him, I rarely saw him. Like, he kind of just, I just knew him as the kid who would like you know, draw comic books. I really didn't see him anywhere except for either in his house or um, later, uh, you know, later on at, at the practice studio. Well, I guess as, like, years went by, like, we, we jammed a couple times, like, in, in various bands. When I was in art school, I decided, well, let me try being in some punk bands because it'd be fun. I still wasn't really singing. I played bass, um, in a band called Nancy Drew that he had gotten together. It was like this like pop punk band kind of thing. And like they just played one show, as far as I know, it was like at a, at a skate park kind of thing. And I mean, it was, you know, nothing special. <laughs> it's just like a pop punk band. So. Did you and Mikey always play together in the bands? Like, yeah. is this? We played in a band a long time ago. We had a band together called Ray Gun Jones, me and him. It was when I was in art school. Like, we were in this one band a long time ago called Ray Gun Jones and he was the vocalist that I was the bass player. And then later on, like, we kind of both pursued other projects, sort of. We kind of kept in touch. We were, I guess, I mean, we were friends, but not like, you know, we didn't hang out all the time or anything. We were just, we just yeah, we were very casual friends, but we still kept in touch. So, basically, I just did this. I went back to doing art and gave up again and wasn't really, still not singing. I didn't know how I sang. So then, uh, after art school, I went and wanted to start the band. After kind of failing at able, being able to make a career in comics, I said, let me just try it again. Well, who started the band? Um, I picked up a phone and pretty much called everybody. So the response I got from a lot of people, like, you sure you want to do this? All right, if you sure that's what you want to do? I thought you were going to be an artist. And I was like, I got a good feeling about it. You know, not too long after 9-11 happened, uh, Gerard had given me a call and told me that he was you know, I hadn't heard him, heard from him in a long time. So what brought all you guys here together? That's what I was going to um, Basically the telephone, um, picking it up, calling people you haven't seen in years, going, you know, are you kind of happy with what you're doing in your life? And then having them say no, and me saying, I, oh, I'm not happy either. Let's try and maybe do a band again and see what happens. And it was kind of a last ditch effort for everybody. Realistically, I had called up Matt right after September 11th. I guess it was more like October. Gerard was on a ferry going to work as a comic book artist. He was drawing, I think, for the Cartoon Network and witnessed the Trade Center Towers going down. I'm pretty sure that he saw the bodies falling from the building. That's when he said, what am I doing with my life? I'm slaving away drawing pictures for corporations and not helping anybody and not making anything in life meaningful for anybody else. He went home and I believe he wrote Skylines and Turnstiles. It's an old song for you guys. You know, I had that song about September 11th, kind of my way of getting over it. This was kind of like a therapy for us when we started. It still is. And I said, just, just, you know, just listen to it. And so I played it for him and sang it. We played it together and, it, and we just loved the way it sounded. Uh, we're like, all right, well, we need a guitar player because I can't sing and play guitar at all. Save my life. So, you know, we got him, and he came to the first practice. And, uh, you know, he had just given me a call and was like, hey, I got, you know, I'm working on some new stuff, and I want you to check it out. I brought my guitar over. Yeah, and it was, it was awesome because I, I hadn't been playing guitar for 
I don't like a year and a half. I was playing drums in a crappy, not, I mean, you know, just like a fun, like, punk rock band. I never played drums before, and I always wanted to play drums, so I sucked at it. They say they played, like, a, a lot of punk shows. I was really into the scene, and I never saw or heard of their band. <laughs> and when I found out he was playing drums in a band, it just bummed me out. Because I thought, like, he's the greatest guitar player I know. Like, hands down. And I've met a lot at that point. I've been around, I've been to art school, I've seen a lot of bands. And to me, in, like, in Jersey, there was nobody that could beat him. I thought he was the best. And they finished Skylines and Turnstiles, which was the first song I think that was ever written by My Chemical Romance. That's if you still got one last left inside that cave you call. I guess the rest is history. In the, in the beginning, when the band was starting out, did things click right away? Did you know this yeah. is so, yeah. so happening, or did you start out sucking right away? But like when our first practice, and the one thing that I noticed most was like how much he gave his vocals performance. You know, like he just really went for it. It's it. It was really the first time I had really sang since I was a little kid. It was nice to, f to find out I was still able to do that, and I was able to do it well. He, he came to me with, with the demo that became My Chemical Romance. Have you ever heard the Attic demos? Because that's all I heard when I, when I first joined the band. The, the, the Attic demos? It's not together, nothing's in tune, like, but... There was just something about it where you could already imagine what it would sound like put together, and it was it was really good. And I would, my band would listen to that demo to and from shows. Like it would get us psyched up to go play. Huh. And I heard it, and and I was like, wow, he's he's fucking got it, you know? Like his voice has just made leaps and bounds. I kind of felt like I had a little bit of a gift, and I was like, all right, cool, like I could use this, you know. Like, this will really enhance the band. Dude, you look fucking freaky in night vision. Do I? Yeah. Hey, you guys want to help me check? I'm going to say check, and then you guys say check. Check! You know, there's something about having a really good band name, too, yeah. like, you know, just right off the bat. We are My Chemical! I remember when, you know, they first came up with that, people were like, oh, so what are you going to call it? And they were like, my chemical was and I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, the, that was the vibe in Jersey. People like, were just like, damn, I didn't think of that. Let me hear you, Georgia! The name of the band. Me and Mikey were working at a Barnes and Noble together. Clifton, New Jersey. He actually got me the job because I was a college graduate that couldn't get a, a job at a bookstore. And it was actually the best shitty job we ever had. He worked in music, I worked in books. My good friend Brian Malloy was the manager at the time. And me and him would always talk about like British music, like all sorts of like culture from there and whatnot. And we, we got on to talking about Irvine Welsh one day. He's a Scottish guy who wrote Train Spotting. That movie's whole vibe we were kind of into, you know? And, um, Acid House, stuff like that. It's such a good movie. He'd grabbed a stack of Irvine Welsh books and brought them in the back, and we were just talking about, you know, all the different ones and whatnot. And Mikey had saw this little blurb. It was either on the inside or the back cover. It says, like, Five Tales of Chemical Romance by Irvine Welsh. Like, the phrase, chemical romance, caught my eye for some reason. Like, I was just, like, flipping through the backs, like, reading what each book was about. I don't know, the term just kind of struck me. I was, like, really shocked that nobody had used that in some sort of a band name before. He was like, it wouldn't be kind of cool if you put a my in front of that, made it my chemical romance. I kind of threw the my on to kind of give it a little, a little twist. And uh, it, it was awesome because uh, it just was, we, there was no band. It was just the band name. Ever, ever since he came up with that band name, it just felt like um, you needed to kind of start a band just so you could use that name. And then when <clears throat> he joined the band, 
Um, he was actually a little hesitant about giving us the name, but it was that good. <laughs> He's like that with Ben. He yeah. comes up with good Ben. He just came up with another one called the New London Fire. No. And somebody has that. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's just a good, yeah, he's a good band namer. So he was always saying like, oh, this is cool if you made a band called Mike Hill Romance. So then I started the band. We didn't have any names. When Mikey joined the band, <clears throat> we were like, uh, hey, Mikey. We could be perfect one that has to be. And I like Starcross lovers when we fight and we can say. We have his band name because it pretty much fits. I was on uh, Will Butcher at the time, so it, it it made a lot of sense for me. That's why I wanted the band name so much. It was about, it meant so much more than drug addiction. It was, you know, for me, it meant out of the presence. Later on, it obviously would turn into drug addiction. I was in another band and they started, and I became a huge fan of that. Well, the funny thing is, Frank and Pensy Prep really kind of discovered us in a way. I met Frank because his band gave us our first practice space. His old band, Pensy Prep. Is that how you knew him, because yeah. you guys were in the same studio? Well, I knew them actually just going to parties at uh, the Eyeball Records house, because mm -hmm. I was on Eyeball Records. <laughs> It was like being a fan of your best friend's band, you know, kind of thing. So it wasn't like, oh, you got you have your autograph. I think it was like, all right, I'll watch you guys practice every day because you practice the same studio as us. And I got MCR like their first 11 shows because my cousin put on shows. And I remember getting up on a chair and watching the first Mike Kemp show. We were terrified. <laughs> You're drunk. We were drunk. Mikey was really drunk. Yeah. Me, me and Mikey had to go pound a bunch of beer in their van. We couldn't believe we were about to do it. We were just terrified, you know. We knew something potentially special was about to happen, but we weren't sure. If we weren't so well received upon just the first song, you know, I don't know what happened. And like, I remember we played Skylands and Turnstiles and like the place blew up. I mean, there was only like 60, 70 kids there, but they were mad into it. And I was just like, wow, I think we got something. And I think, I know I looked at Toro and we were kind of like, all right, we were, we were right about this. And then I have it go from you know, something I would do twice a week. This song's called Vampires Will Never Hurt You. You know what, sing along, please. To something that is my life and, and just took off really fast. t-shirt on that said thank you for the venom at that show i made it Man. myself that's how far in advance i would plan <laughs> things i figured out what's up with the camera what it's brian schecter's sneaky way of spying on us no wait till you meet brian dude oh. he's an intimidating dude <laughs> he's a little scrap i was a tour manager and I would tour nonstop and get demos. And so I heard My Chemical Romance and knew they were the band that I would get off the road for, that I would invest all my time and life savings in. And I flew to see them four days after I heard it and knew right then that I wanted to manage them. They were playing at Maxwell's in Hoboken. I saw them August 15th or 16th, 2002. How, how soon did it take to become really good friends with those guys? It took a long time. Like February 17th of 2003 is when they hired me. What you guys were on was the Eyeball? Yeah, we're on Eyeball Records. Oh, you're still on? Oh uh, no, we were. Were on the first mm -hmm. record. How? What's? What was that experience like? Good, bad, and different? It was. It was fine. The first record was made to kind of capture a moment in time and also <coughs> to have something to tour with. We kind of captured really the genesis of the band on the CD. You know, we were only a band three months when we made that record, and all the songs that were on that record are the only ones we had. Things were all very new. Frank had just joined the band. That was um, weird. Yeah, it was... It just was, joined the band and like, run into the studio. Yeah, it was like two days before or something. Yeah. We decided that we needed another guitar player to join the band, and it was kind of... Um, 
It was scary for me. And, uh, what was your other label? Uh, oh, yeah, other band? Sorry. It was called uh, Fancy Private. Okay. And then that uh, ended, and I formed a band called I'm a Graveyard. And then that ended too. We asked Frank to join the band. They were like, hey, we're looking for another guitarist. Would you want to join? And I was like, definitely. This is my favorite band. And I was kind of, you know, skeptical because, like, I, I, you know, I'd never played with anybody else before. Me and Ray Styles are two styles that shouldn't work together, but do. Uh, Ray grew up learning Metallica records. Then I know Frankie is more like, more, he's more the like punk rock kid. We had a couple of practices, and uh, you know, I just knew that it would work. Like he, you know, he had a different approach to guitar than me, and was able to write parts that my ear would never hear. Some of the stuff he could never do, I, I could never do. And uh, some of the stuff he does, I, I never would want to do. The shit that he does just fucking blows my mind, you know? So I got to join my favorite band and record a record, which was the first one, Party My Bulls. And Frank played on two of the tracks off the first record. One of them is uh, Early Sunsets Over Monroeville. He just plays some great, great parts. When we were doing Monroeville, Ray was laying down his parts, and as soon as he was done, I took the parts that they had recorded into a van that had like, no heat outside the studio and wrote what I was gonna play. <laughs> a lot of the, the melody that he plays during the verses and the choruses is just you know absolutely beautiful and I think really makes, makes those songs work. Making the first record was a really um, amazing experience. The band wasn't was what together maybe like six six months. A few months, that? yeah, not even a year. We were, we were a band. The experience was we worked with um, a dude named John Aclario, who was awesome. He ruled. He recorded, I think, every band in Jersey, uh, New York, any band that you know had kind of had their shit together. He had built himself this, this studio in his mother's basement. Not a studio. Yeah, John, John Aclario's basement. That had started to really thrive. One of the funnier things was us having to stop recording every once in a while because his mother was upstairs vacuuming. Alex from Eyeball put us in there. And he, you know, he was awesome at what he did. Um, it was great. Just great. It was just great fun working with him. He had a great ear, great ear for. Uh, for harmonies. And then Jeff came in to produce it from Thursday. We, we were able to work with uh, Jeff Rickley, which was great. He, you know, he's another one of those guys, you know, just has a great, great ear for melody. Gerard was uh, a good friend of ours before the whole My Chemical Romance explosion. I love that band, My Chemical Romance. Get it down. Gerard a lot about you know delivery. It was like kind of like hanging out with one of your really good friends and making something together, making a record with all your friends. You know, as small and, and whatnot as the studio seemed, like it seemed like when we were doing it, it seemed like we were making like the biggest record. Oh! So unfortunately, I had this problem where our tooth. I went I went to like six or seven hospitals during the making of that record. Well, didn't he have like a rotted tooth or something? Yeah, he, yeah, Gerard went through know a lot well, of, yeah. yeah, Gerard went through a lot of shit. Because I had a tooth that um, had an abscess in it, and nobody could figure it out. He was in tremendous pain for, for you know, to, 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 when doing vocals for the last couple tracks. It was the worst pain I'd felt in my life, so it was really difficult to finish the vocals on that record, and we didn't have a lot of time, we didn't have a lot of money. the lyrics for this is the best day ever the morning of and I remember hopping in a car getting Dunkin Donuts still having not finished them we really had no like identity every so to me at least 
you know, every song on that first record sounds very different from the next. And that's one of the, I think that's one of my favorite things about our band. There's not one set style. You know, if I could pinpoint the most important songs on that record. The most important song is Head First for Halo. Why it's important is that it's a song that kind of started as a joke. But it's the song that I had said to the guys, if we can pull this song off, if we can accomplish this um, and do it believably, like if we believe in the song could work for this band, it'll, we won't ever be pigeonholed. I think Vampires is also important because it, it really locked in that darkness. The um, aesthetic of the band seems to come largely from Gerard and his sort of interest in, you know, um, dark imagery. Oh, that's awesome! Is that something that you vibe with as well? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like, he tells me I have to wear these gloves all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all grew up, like, you know, like, from Jersey, so it's dark to begin with. <laughs> so, you know, it was, I don't know if we were really ready for it, but we were ready to tour, so yeah. that's what mattered. And, we were ready to really take on the world. Touring is the most important thing in this band. I think uh, playing as a live band is the most important thing. I think if we didn't, if we didn't have that, we would have never got off the ground so quickly. When I met Gerard and, and Mike Hem, there were two booking agents that were after them. And booking agents are kind of like managers, which are kind of like record companies, where they kind of court the band and say, hey, you know, we're gonna do this for you. We played a show in Boston. Yeah. Which is, what was it? That's Skate Surf Fest. Skate Fest. What an amazing show that was, too. It was. Like, the first time kids sang along. Kelly Mac Kelly called us up and was like, hey, I like your band. And we were like, wow, we like you. <laughs> yeah, we like you, man. <laughs> you know, without exaggeration, a, a, we basically had about a two and a half year run. He became our booking agent. He put us on tour with, um, first tour was a band called North Star. North Star. <laughs> We toured with them for well, maybe two weeks. Two weeks. And we were like, oh my god, two week tours. So hard. So well, hard. we broke down four times. Yeah. So, so um, I I got in the van and I left. And and on my second tour with this band, I got a scorpion tattooed on my neck as high as I possibly could, so that I couldn't get a job. And my dad called me up and said, oh. He, freaked out. And it's not like we made money, but you could kind of self-sustain on the road. Ooh, the winnings. Wow. Like, um, in the beginning, all we got was water and like, occasionally um, a bag of chips and salsa, and occasionally a buyout, so you can live off that, in a way. I don't know, it's it's just one of those those things that I, 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 I dreamed about it from the time I was seven years old on. I wanted to be in a band. And I wanted to, to play live in front of people. You know, I was like, I'll give up anything in the world if I could be able to do this, and, and I have, you know. Have your parents been real supportive? Yeah, I mean, they always, they always wanted me to play, because my dad and my grandfather played. Um, my mom, uh, she, since I was 11, let me practice in my basement, you know, with bands, and to the point where she couldn't even sleep. I've lost friends, I've lost uh, scholastic careers. <laughs> uh, Frank and Mikey are college dropouts. Ray finished college, I believe, 
or he's he still he's pretty close, I think. <laughs> but when I quit college, they were they were very upset mm -hmm. about that. They wanted me to, you know, have have something to fall back on, and, and I totally agree. I, I should, you know, mm -hmm. I still should, and uh, I, it's not that I didn't want to get my education, but I felt that opportunity was calling me mm -hmm. at that moment, and I was in the right band, and we were touring. And I felt that college had nothing for me at that point because this is all I ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So really, like, I don't have to work. I didn't have to work. I didn't have really any bills. I had, I mean, I had a student loan. I didn't have a cell phone at the time. There's a lot of elements to it, so it was cool. It was kind of like you're poor and you're starving all the time, but you're kind of roughing it, and it's really cool, you know? They had a great time doing that, and it really made them grow up as people. There's been a couple times where I've I've been left at a, I've been left at truck stops, like, and the band's kind of driven a couple miles down the road, and I'd have to call them on my cell phone, you know, call them on the cell phone, and it's like, hey, what's up? And they're like, hey, how's it going, man? And I'm like, you notice something's missing from the van? And they kind of look around and they're like, ah, shit. And then I have to turn around. Just so you know, we ran out of that. <laughs> Just so you know. At least we're in a populated area and there's stuff to do. <laughs> then we did a tour with a Hope's band Fall. called Hope's Fall. And that came under oath. Yes. And under oath was, they were big. Yeah, yeah, they were they were a big band. To us, yeah, at the we had times. no. They had a trailer. Yeah, we were they, like, and a lot of merch and shit. Yeah, <laughs> we every day we go up and ask for t-shirts because we didn't have any clothes. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and they were so nice to us. They were like, yo, like if you need anything, let us know. We'd, we'd eat their food. They were so into us. Yeah. Took all their t-shirts, and then taking back Sunday, took them on a tour with. It was taking back Sunday from Autumn to Ashes, Recover in My Chemical Romance. And it was just this instant friendship form between Take It Back Sunday and My Chemical Romance. And they had fun touring. And then they went from straight from the Take It Back Sunday tour into a used tour. I'll kiss your lips again. I was tour managing a band called Vendetta Red and I had become friends with the used and because they were touring together. And Bert was just like my little brother and, and I love him and his band so much. And then Gerard was this this new kind of friend I had and I really wanted them to get together. And so I introduced Gerard to Bert. He introduced me to Bert from the used. And uh, I went, they met in pizzeria. I think he was like really strange. I thought, yeah, he was a really weird guy when I first met him. Who, who's your favorite member of My Chemical Romance? Um, the singer. And then I became the used tour manager. Who's, what's his name again? Um, yeah. Jared. I said, why don't you take this band on tour? And Bert said, let's take this band on tour. And so they took him, the, the used took my time on tour. He heard the record, brought us on tour, and we kind of all became friends, like great friends, just from touring. So my chem, who was this little band from New Jersey that had been used to playing basements, <laughs> would travel around in their little van and trailer and, and slug it out and get there and killed it every night. Yeah, so like, you know, but my whole family is very supportive and I don't think they uh, understood how good the things were going until we made the Trenton local paper mm -hmm. and that's what they read, so right. they freaked out. <laughs> we made the Trentonian. <laughs> They just went in and, and slowly started winning new fans. And selling more merch, and that's really how you could could 
put it in a barometer of seeing what was working. We are extremely yeah. involved in every creative element of this band, down to the t-shirts. My chemical romance only in this line! Yeah. It's a packed house in here, man. It's not too bad. Oh, we tell everybody else comes in with all this merch. Oh, right, right. The merch kind of killed the thing. The more merch they sold, the bigger their band was. Because nobody could find the record because it just wasn't in store. The, the distribution for it wasn't really well. I don't know what it was about this band, you know, it was the way the guitars and the vocals worked and, and it just, it hit you. you. You had this really magical genesis happening where you you're touching on something you knew never existed before and it was very special and you felt it in your heart. You're like, wow, this is, this is a, a great band, like, if we don't fuck this up, this, this could be legendary. <laughs> At that point is when I stepped in and said, okay, you're now gonna go tour Europe, which they had never done and they'd never even left in the United States. They went to Europe and they did it in a van. They did it the same way that they did it in the US and it was hell. And that's, I spent all of my life savings paying for it because they didn't have the money to do it. They were blown away because it was, they went and played in Germany as this little band from New Jersey and then they showed up in Spain and they they show up and there's kids with homemade t-shirts, homemade My Chemical Romance t-shirts in Spain and we all just kind of like grew as people and as I grew as a manager, the band grew as a band. That was definitely a, um, a challenge to this band to bring it to the next level because we were a very, when we started it was just this totally aggro, cathartic experience where it was just violent and messy and just nuts and half the shit wasn't even working. It didn't um, matter. It didn't matter. It was awesome. And then, you know, stuff started to happen and and then stuff needed to work. Yeah. So give me all your poison and give me all your pills and give me all your hopeless hearts and make me ill. You're running after something that you'll never kill. If this is what you want, then fire at will! Alright, tell me that this is not ridiculous. Uh, My Chemical Romance got phone calls from major labels in the practice studio before they even played a show. Is that right? Yeah. Maybe the second week I was in the band, we went out for drinks with a major label. Yeah. Just because they were... We, Signed from to Jersey. Jersey. Like, you couldn't walk down the street without a major label, like, coming out from an alley and trying to buy you a drink or something. Yeah, yeah. We're from Jersey. And we're signing to Igo Records. There was such a signing frenzy going on. There was just major labels everywhere. Like, we played a show in a basement in Philly. Five people. One of there which you. was a homeless uh, person who had a, yeah bootlegged our set and then tried to sell us the tape afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and another one, one of the people there was uh, an A&R from a major label. And then kind of began the process of talking and meeting a lot of A&R people, um, which we basically kindly told them, leave us all alone. And basically we were like, this is ridiculous, please let us just please. be a band. Yeah. So we waited about like a year before we even signed. Will I be the demographic? So uh, who's your who's your A&R guy? Uh, uh, Craig Aronson. So how did how did My Chemical Romance end up on Reprise Records from Eyeball Records? I think uh, it's just a, your you know typical story of how this stuff happens, and and um, and it's what I love to see the most from a band. They were on uh, an, an indie label, Eyeball Records, and they had put out a record on their own. They've been touring a lot, 
uh, behind that and building a fan base of their own. And how did how did you guys come to meet? Did you come sign you? <coughs> he, he flew out to CMJ in New York. We had long meetings and, and conversations, you know, me and the band over a long period of time. I think it took nine months. And was the, the reason you went with Craig for any specific um, reason? He signed Less Than Jake two times. He tried to sign Jimmy and Will twice. Um, all from moving to different labels. So when he loves a band, there's nothing he'll fight for more than that band, you know. And we saw that. You no, know, they spent a lot of time thinking about it, and you know they were very careful. They were they wanted to do it at the right pace, and then eventually, after uh, a lot of um, you know of really analyzing and seeing if this is the right home for them, we were fortunate enough to you know to win their hearts, and they signed with us. We just got so sick of seeing bands rip off our friends and get huge, just completely mutilating our friends' band sound, and 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 you know and just turning it into something, exploiting it, and then getting large off it. We were just like, we don't want to be that band. Like, we don't want that to happen to us. We don't want to not take the chance, have somebody just mm -hmm. do a watered down version of us and then get big and then like, who's going to get our message then? Like, who's going to get the point of it, you know? So we said, fuck it, let's do it. As soon as they were on Warner Brothers, we, uh, you know, we went in and started talking about making the record, went in and made the record and here it is, on reprise. It's again, simple starting out and building in a very natural way. Revenge is really the band. Bullets is the band trying to find itself. By the time we hit Revenge, we had really become My Chemical Romance. Revenge, it was a completely different ball game. You know, we had this phase called pre-production. It was different. You showed up to this big studio, you know, it was a lot like money and like crazy equipment they had and microphones that cost more than your first car. What was your first car, Gerard? It was a Subaru XT. It was silver. Never had to wash it. You know, it was very strange going from the first record you know, changing your own guitar strings. We had a lot of tools at our disposal this time. To being, you know, playing on, the, playing in a major studio and being able to play like vintage guitars. And then we met this dude who came in in sweatpants oh, man. And, a, and a hockey jersey. And his name was Howard Benson. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, the first time I saw the band was in rehearsal. They played a few songs for me. I remember when he pulled up, and I was just like, somebody ordered pizza? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's notorious for his sweatpants. Um, some company was supposed to make him his own signature brand. Like, uh, are you serious? All honesty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had made four Motorhead records, and that's what got us interested about him. He was like, yeah, I did Motorhead. Yeah. <laughs> then he's like, yeah, I did Motorhead. And we were like, oh. Yeah, I went to Brazil and did Sepultura. It was like the first Pro Tools record ever that I did. <laughs> what also got us interested about him was the fact that he contacted us, and that's like how, how we like to work. I like the fact that Gerard was into comics. I know it sounds crazy again, but he had a vision. He was into co comic books and the whole vision of comic books, and I know he wanted to impart that whole vision to his music and his band. I mean, lyrically, you know, we wanted to take music to a place that hadn't been in a long time, which was to tell stories and use, you know, kind of these sweeping metaphors and instead of just, you broke my heart. What inspires our songs is being a product of how we grew up, watching a lot of horror movies, reading a lot of comic books, and kind of tempering that with real life. Um, everything we write about is real. Um, it's just the metaphors we choose in which to to describe it. Yeah, it started up as a concept, and then, you know, I found that my real life and the real life of the band had a lot more to do with what the band wanted to talk about. The best part about Revenge as a record that I, for all the concept record stuff that's going on in it, and all the fiction and everything, when you really break down the record, it's a record that, you know, worldwide people love that's about two little boys that lose their grandma. In November, me and Mikey had lost our grandma, and that kind of changed the way the record went at that point. When Gerard and Mikey lost their grandma, like we're, you know, we're all family. She, 
she actually, um, her and, her and uh, his grandfather had like a huge part in the band being where they are today. Like we would never have started touring if they hadn't. Like they bought us our first van, and we would have never started touring. So like when we, you know, when he experienced that loss, like we felt it too. So we were, you know, we were just like. Yeah, this is, what, this is what where the record needs to go. What's the story behind the title of the album? I wanted it to kind of be like the title to a movie that wasn't really a movie, <laughs> an unfinished movie or a movie that was never made. Um, and as soon as we finished the first record, that was the title I'd had in my head for the second. And I have the title for the third in my head now, so it's usually about the time I finish, or a few months after we finish the first record, that I, I get the title for the next one. This record is almost a rock opera in a bizarre way, and maybe it wasn't intended to be like that, but it feels like that to me. Working with Howard was it was a really cool experience. Howard's very important as far as like teaching us the golden rules of song structure. <laughs> it's spelled C-H-O-R-U-S. I think my contribution to the songs is like, I wrote all the songs on this record. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a producer joke. They wanted to be as good as they could be in the studio, so um, I think they, they worked with Howard kind of in a, in a kind of like a, a coach kind of, of way. He was like our coach. Yeah. He was like a sports coach. Like Howard, he was the kind of guy that'll challenge you and even something that make you yeah. make you doubt, you know? He made a lot of references to, you know, what being in a band is like and even making the record like um what is it, like a basketball team. Yeah, like you know, plays like everybody, and stuff. Huh? Yeah, like everybody has, you know, a specific role. He would basically be like, you know, what are you doing? Like <laughs> yeah, we'd, be, we'd come in and we'd be like, nah dude, it's got this part that's like Aah. and he'd be like, What does that part mean? Like, it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the song. Like, you're just confusing the shit out of me. Like, and we're like, that's the point. That's the point. Remember how many times we said, that's the point. None of this thing shit means anything. None of this stuff. Zero. Nothing. It's garbage. It means what you write and your intense thing, what you have to say, and the emotional thing that you put out, that means something. Not, you know, oh, wow, look at all these guitars. I, I'm, I can shred. You know, who cares? Nobody cares. He, he would push you, you know? Like, you'd go to him and, and you know, we'd all play a song and he'd go, you know, you'd be like, dude, he's gonna freaking love this, you know? Oh, yeah, that was... And he'd just be like, hmm, I don't oh. get it. <laughs> or, you sure you want to do that part? You know, like, you'd, you'd go in thinking, you know, this is not shit, dude. He, he would kind of bring you back down a little bit. I think that band's work ethic was probably one of the best I've seen. But they're very, very easy to work with in the studio and, and very open-minded. It makes you have that self-doubt. And a lot of times when you doubt, you doubt yourself, you end up creating something better. We would go to rehearsal, I would say to them, I think we need to write this new part, you need to write this new part, you need to come up with something. They would stay up all night and come back to rehearsal the next day with it finished and done. And the guitar players would come in, they, they were so excited to be in here and they, they, they jumped around the room and played as hard as they could. Their work there, I think, was incredible, actually. song, The Ghost of You, it was arranged a little differently. Um, from what I remember, the song the song has the bridge, it's like that quiet bridge, and then it comes in with like that you know, heavy drum beat, heavy like, and guitars come in like full force. And on the record, after that section, there's another chorus that comes up. The, uh, the way that we had originally arranged it was just the bridge into that heavy section and then the song ends. Howard pushed for having another chorus there. And we all hated having that chorus in that song. We thought that the song was done, not into it at all. So me and Gerard were listening to the version that Howard had suggested with that chorus after that heavy part and you know the, the bridge plays and that heavy part comes in and then that last chorus kicked in and, and we just both like our eyes lit up and we just said fuck he's right like it had like such a great great impact after we figured out what he was mm -hmm. trying to teach us we learned it he tried yeah. to teach the song structure and once we 
we, we learned that from him. We ran with it for a week and a half straight. We were like, Damn. Yeah, we wrote yeah, like no. five or six more songs. We were way psyched. We made the record and we were on tour literally the next day. <laughs> So, uh, is this your first time on the Warped Tour? Yes. Yeah. You guys having fun so far? Oh, it's been amazing. That's when I started to really get heavily involved in, in taking pills and drinking. What kind so, of pills? Uh, Xanax. I'm not drunk or anything. I'm on a loose, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking fine. <laughs> Gerard Way is an alcoholic. It's just something that, unfortunately, I felt I had to do to be Gerard on stage. I want this song to go out to them. It's very personal. It's about me and Mikey's grandma and the motherfuckers call later. If you know the words, sing it with me. It took a long time to get over that. And he was completely wasted. I think his pants fell down. <laughs> Lost your pants again. It's that women's cut. They always fall down. While I was tour managing the used and managing my chemical romance at the same time, Gerard drinking was just Gerard drinking. That was what he did. And, and he progressively got worse and worse. I need more beer. I'm not even drunk. Could you take the last beer? You almost, well, you know. I got fall, there's only one left. I feel amazing. Yeah, you guys are so amazing. I'm over-medicated. Drink a few beers today, but only a few, because it's so hot. He would drink more and more, and would get just loaded. We got this shit already, man. Shit is easy peasy, pumpkin peasy. Pumpkin pie, motherfucker. That's the pro Gerard. Don't fuck up. Don't fuck up. Oh. I've been down with kickball since okay, the yeah, third yeah. grade, man. My dick! My dick! My dick! Simultaneously, the other members of the band were doing similar things, except for whoever had to drive. It's basically two me and Frank drinking beer. I don't know, I think we're winning, but I'm really drunk, so. This is kickball game. This is the most fun I've had. Because it was biblical. They're amazing and dramatic, and I fucked up a little, but you know what? I was, uh, shh, I was good. That was the beginning of this downward spiral. Intervention wasn't working at that point. Like, my discussions with him just weren't, his band's discussions with him weren't, he, he wanted to be drunk. Okay. That's, you know, he was a growing boy with this weird position he was in where he was singing in this band that had grown up a little too fast. He's alive! Yeah. Uh, what happened was, I um, went right off the sidewalk and into the bushes. I was like, whoa! I fucking killed like so many plants. <laughs> Let's go. All right, thank you guys for all fucking coming out. So we have an early show. There's so many friends with them in there. All their country, all you guys. It was our record release show. And it was sold out. And I remember there was like something like 2,500 people there. And just like seeing that many people just moving in unison or singing along, it was so overwhelming. Today is? Tuesday. What day? 2004. Yeah. What, what is it? Day of our record. Okay. I'm Joey Southside here to tell you about my friends in My Chemical Romance's new record. Three cheers for Sweet Revenge. Three cheers for Sweet Revenge! <laughs> the funniest thing about Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge is that the label and I had agreed that if we could sell 300,000 copies, 
we would be happy. The record just dropped. That's why I feel pretty extra excited. And then, you know, the first week of sales, I had predicted 3,000. And we had no idea what was going to happen. And the very first day, we kept getting phone calls about how great things were going. And I think right about then is when we realized something weird was going to happen. Dude, I think my mom bought most of them. And the fact that the very first day it had sold twice as many as the entire record, the last, the previous record had sold in its whole lifespan at that point, uh, I think we realized that something big was about to happen. I think she bought about 10,999. You know, they just continued working through the through the summer. You that you sold you sold nine thousand. Yeah. Was making your number two request here on K Rock. Oh. That's awesome. Next to you two. Wow. John Candy. And what's the fan? And then it was just a flood of good news. They sold like 120,000 records through that summer. Lives of my chemical romance. Kind of growing up with our with mom and dad, it was, it was a weird kind of household. All of our families are pretty strange. At the time of 9 11, Gerard was a recent art school grad who quit his job as a cartoonist to pursue the band full time. His artwork graces the cover of their new CD, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, a concept album inspired by the band's love of horror flicks. I watch a lot of bad movies and I, I read a lot of comic books. I sometimes think fiction is the best metaphor, and sometimes fiction's actually more fact. And look at us. Here we are. There we are in San Francisco. What magazine is that? Max and Blender. Dave Chappelle on a cover, which is pretty cool. I look good for a photo shoot, right? So what's gonna happen in the photo shoot? We're gonna cover this blonde girl in blood. She doesn't even know it yet. Seriously, every single photo shoot that we were doing had some form of blood in there. I uh, can't think of one that, that hasn't. So you're into that? You're no problem Well, that. I don't have any problems with it. The only thing is we've done two shoots with blood already. Already? Yeah. The first one was we had bloody cheerleaders. Okay. And so blood wasn't going on. Yeah. The second one we did for Kerrang, uh, it was blood like on our hands. Because that was like the main sort of like idea I had. Yeah. Take that away from me, I'm screwed. I, uh, <laughs> That's partially our fault. It is, it really is. Because when we started doing the, the photo shoots, I know one of the first ones was, let's cover ourselves in blood. Wow, that's dope blood. Yeah. Oh, it's fucking amazing. Let's start shooting. One, two, three. Perfect. 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 I'm sick of seeing my face. I broke up but I am allowed to be sick of seeing my face because it's my fucking face. face. You know what I'm saying? What happened? Are you drinking tonight? Well, I'll get fucked up later. I need liquor. The amount of pills I'm taking. Hey Gerard, I filmed you. I filmed you puking. I know. I saw you like way far over there. Yeah, he's gonna puke again. I get better. It took about. <clears throat> a little less than a year and he hit rock bottom. So when he hit rock bottom, it was about a week worth of rock bottomness in July of 2004. They were in, uh, in the Midwest, which was central time, and I was in Brooklyn, which is Eastern time, and so a lot of 5 a.m. phone calls. I didn't want the band to ever go through like a VH1 behind the music scenario, where it's like, then everything collapsed. I didn't want that to happen. The first couple times were him, I think, opening up 
a little bit and saying, I have a problem. The second couple times were him fighting that he had a problem. And the last time was him wanting to kill himself. It made me suicidal, which is, you know, I had been suicidal a couple of times in my life and not this bad. Yeah, to the point where you start thinking about and it, it as an escape route, that's when it gets serious. When you're like, well, if anything really bad ever happens, I'll just, yeah, I'll just do this and it'll be fine and I'll be able to go away. So that, that was where booze and pills had gotten. I don't think I got off the phone until 7.30 in the morning or so. And he had done a lot of drugs and he had admitted to me that it wasn't just the pills and the booze. He had moved on to cocaine and that's, uh, it's like a slap in the face. You kind of go, oh, shit. People need to live their lives the way they want and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be preachy. Like if people like to drink, that's awesome. It just doesn't work for me. And that last phone call where he was going to kill himself, I had to talk him out of it. I talked him down and I waited till some of the drugs had worn off and told him to go wake up his tour manager who was out sleeping. And, uh, and he went and woke up the tour manager and they went for a walk. Well, my band really believed in me and it, because of that they had saved my life again. Jerry and he had a little walk and I called Jerry and explained to him what had happened and Jerry's a straight edge guy and didn't pass judgment for a second, didn't, you know, wasn't upset because Gerard had done it behind his back, wasn't bummed out <clears throat> because it wasn't his lifestyle. Jerry got him through the next two hours until Gerard finally passed out in his bone. Uh, I wanted us to win and I wanted us to do some good, fight the good fight, keep fighting the good fight. And the only way I, I, I knew I could do that was was just by quitting. Drug cleaned up, you know, he's completely sober. From that time until he was clean and sober was about 17 days. Is music really what's allowed you to keep going? <coughs> yep. It's This band saved my life twice. And, uh, what do you mean twice? Well, in the beginning, because I was so depressed, and then again when I was an alcoholic. You know, it's, it saved my life, it gave me a purpose, which I was sorely lacking in my life, and it was damaging who I was. And, to the point where I was going to be nothing, you know. Um, so it saved my life, and, and it's there to save other people's lives. He's doing an amazing job cleaning up. You know what I mean? Like he's doing a really good job. Why were you Why were you late? Because we wanted to eat at a diner, not drinking, not partying. Just eating. Just wanted to have a veggie burger. <laughs> I'm just glad I got over the fact that I felt like I needed it to be in this band, especially a band that's called My Chemical Romance, right? Isn't that ironic? And for the last night I lie, could I lie with you? If you or someone you know are severely depressed, you need to fucking talk to somebody. Your best friend Since the face-to-face -face tour, a lot's changed. Um, we have a new drummer named Bob from Chicago we love very much. Um, I got clean and sober, basically, and that made the shows change pretty dramatically because um, my singing got a lot better. So, like, it was two huge changes for our band. We've become a new band. Bob joined at a, a really integral point in, in My Chemical Romance because uh, nobody was really sure what was going to happen with us. Uh, Joy was getting sober. And, uh, you know, we had lost our drummer. And when that decision was made, and Gerard was wasted, and the record was starting to do what it was doing, which was make an impact and be, you know, this thing, all I could keep thinking in my head was, fuck, here it goes. This is, it's gonna be just one of those legendary records that never was, because the band's not gonna make it through it. When I got clean and sober, which is August 11th. Um, we had to go on tour six days, seven days later. Not only with a new drummer, but literally a new singer. Because <laughs> I had never played a show sober. It was terrifying. That first show was, I, I didn't know what was gonna happen right now. Like I was really happy that Bob was around, 
but I remember those first couple shows. Man. Don't even worry about it, dude. These kids don't give a fuck. They just want to see a good fucking show. You guys ready for my chemical romance? Yeah, baby. And then three shows in, though? I was like, old band again. wow, yeah, this is this is what it fully should have been. It kind of was like the tornado was over. Sound. He was out with the used. I used to always beg Brian to have Bob come out and do something for us. I used to beg and plead. He's like, no, we can't afford it. He's like, I don't need it. He'll do it for free, he said. <laughs> Bob loves My Chemical Romance. Bob went to Europe with us for free when he was off tours one time just because, you know, that was, that was an, another tour where it's just myself and the band and Bob. And Bob was doing sound. He's definitely one of the best front of house sound guys in the business. Like yeah. he's mixed thrice, they used so many great bands and you know he's he's made these bands sound phenomenal. He had a career, like he had like a good paying job. Yeah I did and they came out with us and went to death. Our dear brother and best friend in the whole world. While they're in Japan is when like the decision was made. Mm -hmm. They uh, started kind of comments about being in the band, and then the official offer was put out. Do you want to be in the band? And I said, Hell yeah! And then they got back from Japan. As soon as they got back, the day they got back from Japan, I flew out. I was on that Project Revolution tour. Mm -hmm. I left that tour to go to Jersey. Like that rehearsal day. But we didn't have much time. What do we have? Like two or three days to actually rehearse before we went out on the tour. Like two days. We had like two, two, two days, yeah. nights. Yeah, yeah, one, two. Yeah, yeah, one, two. And he yeah. was able to do it. Like we, we had three yeah. practices and three practices. We went, we went show. Out. Yeah, we went out face to face. And they were pretty mad at me for them not having more time. But we canceled a few shows because of it all. And uh, and my theory on it was it's your fault that 
you have to cancel shows because you can't work out your problems internally, but it's not the fans' fault and they shouldn't suffer because of it, so goodbye, go on tour. And now you feel you're here to stay? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Unless your friends fire you. Yeah, maybe, we'll see. Bob joined the band, and before Bob had ever played a show, we filmed the Not Okay video. You like D&D, Audrey Hepburn, Fangoria, Harry Houdini, and Croquet. You can't swim, you can't dance, and you don't know karate. Face it, you're never gonna make it. I don't wanna make it. I just wanna. And then Not Okay came along, which was our first technically, technically real video shoot because yeah. it involved a lot of money, a lot of people. So Bob was in, had done a, a major rock music video before ever playing a single show with My Chemical Romance. I haven't even had a show yet. Are you serious? Yeah. We did that before the face-to-face -to -face tour? Yes. If you wanted honesty, that's all you had to say. I never want to let you down or have you go. It's better rough this way. That was the first time, um, well, I guess it would be the second time we played together. We yeah. had the one rehearsal day and then went straight to the video. And that was pretty sketchy because you know, while I love Bob, and while Bob's a great drummer, we still were never sure that Bob was going to be the drummer in My Chemical Romance. I wasn't even in the band yet. There was, I was kind of just the dude that was just kind of playing. I've been to a lot of other video shoots, being on the other side, um, and then being in front of the camera was extremely weird for me. Don't hit the camera. People have told me that whenever there's a camera around, I tend it's to go the other way. Tend um, to go the other way, or or, or I hit it, or hit I kick it, your it hand in front of your or I or I smash it. Fuck so mad. Get the fuck <laughs> camera away from me. <laughs> Stop filming. <laughs> Come on! Well, stop being so Get off of me. Yeah. Fucking get that fucking piece of shit off of me. Let me see it. Hold it up. <laughs> Hold it up. That camera's on me, dog. Stop. 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 Pre stop. Pre stop. Stop. Bob's a behind the scenes guy. That's why Bob yeah. had to go from being a behind the scenes guy to a guy thrust into the limelight. Like a supergirl. Superbomb. Super I've always been a guy that's kind of been on the other side of the camera. What are you doing, bro? Just filming. Yeah, you're a man of many talents. I know. Bob Cam. Sound, I drumming. I got a steady right. hand here. Whoa. Steady Bob, hand. Bob, Bob Cam. Get out of here, Bob Cam. Okay. There, there's Mikey. There's Rock. What's up, dude? Yo. Party time. So <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and it all worked out for the better. Trust me. I'm there. Got through it. He, yeah, no, he pulled he pulled it off great. I like everybody, you know, in the band got their gets close-up shots where the cameras just kind of focused on what they were doing and we just had we you know we had a blast watching them play. And so it seems like all of the hardships of that time period were almost a test. <laughs> It was almost like, look, you have this special thing, you have this special band, you have this great, amazing record. Can you make it through it? And if you do, you know, like, it's like Candyland. If you get past the bad people, then all of a sudden you get the lollipop or something. Hey, this is Gerard from My Chemical Romance. You're listening to our new song, I'm Not Okay, on Man Cow's Morning Madhouse on the Free Speech Radio Network. I love the video. Oh. The video's great. Hey, very, very cool. Much. Thank keeps you, you watching because it keeps building and. It was right? a lot of fun, man. It was really collaborative. You know, the guy did it was really good. He did a bunch of videos. You know what, dude? Don't give anyone else credit. If you're going to be a lead singer, it's all about you. <laughs> you got to dust these guys, take credit for everything. That's what you do. We're at the very genesis of this young man's career. It all starts here, ladies and gentlemen. Where do we go from here, kid? Where do we go? Um, right here. Did you guys see you guys in the paper this morning? I didn't. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Hey, go if you guys want to take I was in the Friday section this morning's Cleveland Plain Dealer. And they, they actually wrote very highly of it. My Chemical Romance, the CD's called Free Cheers for Sweet Revenge. We're at the Agora tonight with Story of the Year. 
Oh man. There it is. Oh man. It looks hot. Yeah, it does. It looks awesome. <laughs> it's good, man. Oh shit, look. <laughs> look at, they're in the same cover as Kid Rock. Look Kid at that. Rock. I mean, Prince of Choice. Insane Clown Posse. And they're on the same cover. How is yeah. that? See? This is huge. We want to stop by and see the and everything. Certainly, it's good singing. It's good singing. Yeah. Yeah. Superstar. It'll never be that way with us anyway. Like it, all of a sudden, it was like the My Chemical Romance explosion happening. It's weird, like, you know, you never, you're never sure if your band's gonna get to that point where you start playing a lot of TV, and then we did, and we really, really felt like Martians at that point. We're going to MTV Studios to record a live performance for, what is it? Uh, uh, something in Download? Discover and Download. Oh, there's something that's gonna Discovered air Download. on regular MTV, yeah, called Discover and Download, and we, we played this thing in, in their studio, the TRL studio, and Chad from New Family hosted it, and oh, it was cool. a great time. It felt like something really bizarre and new. playing with the Libertines and some yeah, rapper. Yeah. So it should be kind of cool. So one, one of 50 Cent's crew. Oh, oh so one of the G-Units, yeah. I'm very excited. How white am I? I know. Ah. Oh, yeah. nice. Pretty white. It's complete. It's really weird. Um, it's, you know, it's... It's one of those things that like you dream about, I guess, when you're, you know, playing guitar in front of your mirror. And it's kind of weird. We've never played like any of these like weird tape within things, you know. But it was great. It was a lot of fun. After a couple songs, we kind of warm up. Like, yeah, I want to play all night. It's good though. I really like it. And, you know, your parents get to watch you on TV, and that's the best part. Yeah. Because then they call you up and they go, "I'm so proud of you." And it's awesome because our parents are so supportive of us. Hey, hey, Mr. Cameraman, what's going on? Oh, right. Hey, look at this. Look at the camera. Camera. Look at the camera. That's my mom. That's my great uncle, this is my grandfather, that's my dad. I am very proud of you, I really am. I'm a musician and I never ever dreamed of having the success that, uh, that he's having now. And uh, I just, I didn't want him to get into this because because I knew what a tough life it was. So he really took the ball and ran with me. So so cool, you have your, uh, your dad, your grandfather and your uncle, like yeah. all kind of little, little you know. <laughs> Family fan club almost. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, that's great. Oh, they'll come with like stickers and stuff. Like, Can you sign this for my, my friends? <laughs> oh yeah. You got two shows. You want to come both? No, I'm not. Yeah. yeah. Uncle Jack's boy. And my father's a musician. I'm surprised. I think he has more energy than anybody I've ever seen. Like, it's unbelievable. Because my, my grandfather has like a, a refrigeration business and like he'll deal with clients and be like, I knew who you guys were and <laughs> see you guys are, are really big, you know, and I'm like, oh man, it's so weird. They do such a magnificent job. That's the entire group. Our flight's at 6.30 in the morning. Not 7.30. We'll be there at 4.30? So we have to be there at 4.30. <laughs> We might as well. If you guys want, we can just go there. You have to leave MTV, go to your hotel, to get on a plane to fly to your venue where there's a bus that you can go to sleep on. Wait till you fly from here to the UK, the UK to Japan, Japan to Hawaii, and then Hawaii back to the US. Yeah. All in one day. It's early and I'm tired. Hey. This fucking plane is too fucking small, man. Tour have lots of Nintendo benefits. Yeah, we got um, first day they gave us a GameCube. 
Free Nintendo. Where? That's, that's to the sponsors of Tours Nintendo. They just recently gave us Donkey Konga, the bongo game. Oh! No! Go! No! I don't have. Ah, oh, oh, it's for the hamsters. Oh, it's for the I told you I was a kid. Ah, oh, this is so perfect. We are so far from you. Well, this was the tough one. This was the big one. This was the video where we were like, all right. This is gonna be a touchy one. Helena is, you know, probably, you know, one of the, like the favorite song off the record for everybody because it has so much, um, you know, so much meaning behind it. We wanted the video to be like a homage to, to my grandmother, and but we also didn't want it to be that much of a super downer, you know. She wouldn't have liked it to be a super yeah. downer. song is celebrating someone's life and when someone passes you should focus on all the good that that person has done and, and, and try not to you know really think about the fact that they're not going to be on this earth any longer but that they had an effect on you and your lives and that's what you should take out of it. And when I watched Tracy do the dance um, on the on the little screen while they were filming it. I got so emotional I had to leave. It was it was really hard for me to watch. Carrying that coffin in the rain was really really tough on everybody. It was a miserable, miserable video shoot, but it, it had to be. And it was most representative of the band, visually and artistically, I think. I mean, they did the Helena shoot and they walked away from that video shoot with those outfits. We had just gotten our Helena um, costumes. <laughs> so we decided to start wearing them because we really liked the way we looked. We kind of started to feel like a gag. That kind of kicked it off. They kind of became this band that was going to have a uniform. Not as in like, we're all gonna look the same. It was, we're gonna look sweet. So they started developing it. When I first started talking to My Chemical Romance, when I first started talking to Gerard, they never had any money. They never had any means, so they had to hodgepodge it together. I think I'm just gonna wear maybe uh, my new mummy t-shirt. And... Oh, where'd you get it, Zipper? Yeah. What size? Two, two, two small, smalls, I think. Mommy, you know. Leather jacket um, destroyed, fell apart due to sweat. Wait until your friends see this, they're gonna call you a girl. Handsy. And then they did the Helena shoot. And it was all over. You need to wear your white shoes with that. Huh? Yeah, you need to wear your fucking Those white loafers. Fuck, you have shoes. Fuck! I forgot to get hand sanitizer. Fuck you. How do I look? Dead as fuck. I feel about this. I like it. I think it looks good. Yeah, it's kind of bulky. Give 
getting all partied up. Do you have like, glitter in that? Yeah. What are you doing? Don't tape me straight in my hair. You're looking <laughs> the creep. You're doing something? Taping you getting ready for the show. Uh, Don't tape me straight in my hair. Why not? Because I want you to. I tried my hair straight and then it just didn't work. I liked it straight, but it just works that. Uh, I'm just weird with the way I look. I don't think I look good anyway, so... Uh, you look good. Who takes the longest in the mouth to get ready for shows? It's probably me. I mean, I, I get... I get... It takes two hours. Yeah. Don't let your eye get tweaky. Come on. I can't help it. Stop. <laughs> I can't help it. There at one point. Deal with it. There at... <gasps> look down. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Do you wear a similar style for an entire tour and then change it to the next one, or is it all just spontaneous? It's all very spontaneous, but... Um, just by the way I am, I change things constantly. Now, it's just gonna keep going. I wanna get like the run of their fucking eyeshadows. <laughs> if I could get some white too from them, that'd be way sweet. Are those new pants? Yeah, these new, pants. new tight pants. Oh, that's shot. Get this, scope that, man, huh? What is that? Oh, God! <laughs> For some reason, they don't wash their clothes, or they won't get them dry clean, and I don't know why. And I, I keep telling them to buy new outfits, or doubles, or duplicates, and they just don't do it. This smells awful! <laughs> You're a hot motherfucker, I'm but you it. know what I'm saying is that hot also brings stink. Like pigs sure, in the mud, they gotta cool down. About anything wrong down there? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, Eating, normally, showering, and sleeping all aren't worked out into your day when you're in band. Everything on this bus stinks. <laughs> I do find out though that like a hot shower kind of makes you feel like a human being again. Life on the warp Tour, taking a shower outside. I haven't showered it. It's gonna be seven days tomorrow. Wait, did you overflow the toilet? It's overflowing. It's overflowing. It's fucking funny. Hey, deep pain. <laughs> oh my god. Oh jeez. You you gotta love somebody to smell them yeah. at their worst for, for I get weeks pretty on end. Too. You ever thought about washing it? I did. I just washed it, and then I wore it once. It yeah. smells like this. There's I something wrong. It shouldn't smell like this after one wear. It smells like the shit in there. <laughs> <laughs> Not us. We had a huge meeting. The bus is always dirty. Poor Doug has just given up trying to clean the bus, and he's laughing, but he knows it's true because there's no room for anything. And because we fucking live like animals. We live with each other. Uh, we're in each other's faces. We sleep 24 7. With each other. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's it. It's been us versus the world. Bob, ow! Bob, oh, my head. Are you gonna get out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a little reading tail there, right, Toro? That's not much. Oh, Sleeping in the bunk area um, is not that bad because we were in a van for two and a half yeah. years. Sleeping on each other. Bunks rule. Peeing on yourselves. <sighs> wasted. Um, covered in dirt, grime, shit, piss, everything. Um, so when you ha when first time we got our bunks, we were like, hell yeah. <laughs> and we still feel that way about them. We've been on them a long time now. Gerald, what are you doing? Eating up my coffee. I wake up and I drink a lot of fucking coffee all day and I smoke a lot of fucking cigarettes and it sucks. What are you doing? Drink coffee and smoke alone. It's freezing. Freezing. Just have a day in the life of Gerard. Going to get coffee. This is what Gerard sees. Going to get coffee. That's all of me. <laughs> Some people choose to live by coffee. Mikey chooses to live by coffee. Gotta choose your poisons. I like Starbucks. I know people are gonna hate me for saying it, but... Nah, man. You can't. It's so damn good. Coffee's one of those things that, uh... My body is now physically and mentally addicted to. Where do you get this fucking filter thing? Oh, oh here it is. Sorry. It's my only voice left, you know? I don't drink or anything. I don't do drugs. Hey, you gonna tape us over in our coffee? Where's Hell this? yes! We send runners for, like, lattes. That's what we do. Are you guys avid readers? Okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're all pretty big readers. Except yeah. for me. All right, what are you doing? Reading about video games. I like reading comic books. We read a lot yeah. of comic books. Finding good books? No. 
Yeah, your magazines? No, you want to go look at me? Yeah. What do you got here? Cracked magazine. Have you ever read it? Ah, I used to read this all the time as a kid. It was one of the worst magazines in the world. It was like, we're not as funny as mad. This spray right here. Oh, thank you. Do you need like comments? Whoa, badass. Thanks, man. This is going to rip. What are you doing, John? Fucking John. Hellboy. Yeah, it is Hellboy. I'm actually a huge fan of Hellboy. Oh, what are you doing? Doing a little French art. Little rocks out in France. Fuck that. I don't want that there. A scary vampire, frightening mummy. What are you drawing this for, Gerard? Fans? Fans. Kids at what contest? Uh, I'm working on a comic. You know what it's going to be about? Superheroes, because oh I never did superheroes before. What is this? That's my superhero comic I'm It's kind of like the X-Men. You were mentioning a couple of their names and stuff. Yeah, this on. one right. I'm working on called The Seance, and he's a guy who he uses a Ouija board to contact dead superheroes, and he gets their powers when they possess him. Fucking draw city. Shit of it, dude. What shit of it? And I got this guy called... Uh, I think I'm gonna call him the Darwinist or something, or Dr. Darwin, and he's a guy that got in an accident, and they had to put his head on the body of a gorilla, and he has to wear this kind of apparatus to keep himself alive, kind of like an iron lung, but he gets all the abilities of like a superhuman gorilla. If you could have any other job besides the band, what would it be in life? Um, I'd probably... Uh, illustrate stuff. Do you have a, an outlet to get your stuff published? Um, no, but I'm sure Good. it wouldn't be hard now. No, I kind of got shit on for years in the comic industry. I'm pretty sure I'd have an easy time. Oh, wow. You're a bass player. <laughs> getting one out now. You guys having a good time tonight? Are you amazed and surprised that, like, people have picked up on you guys the way they have and things have really steamrolled? I think what's cool about us too is I think, I mean me and Gerard are like 27, we're, <laughs> we've gotten past the point, <laughs> look at this, I just put my hand in a cupcake. <laughs> We've gotten past that point, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's not a concern for us. Like, the main concern, I think, for us is just being successful and making good music and, and, and just making this thing last as long as it needs to last. One minute, guys. One minute. Oh, oh. One minute. Get it going on. And then came TRL, which was, that was terrifying. That was so weird. Terrifying, because it's live TV. You know, some people might question why we played it, but it was on, you know, we kind of wanted to do it as kind of like a fuck you. And to, you know, to show that bands like the bands like us, you know, could do things like that and make it fun and make it cool. Tiro gets real weird, especially when you stand on top of a drum, fall oh, yeah. off like an idiot. <laughs> and ruin the backbone of the set of the song. We got about halfway through that song, which is live on TV, and Frank ended up on top of my kick drum. And then inside it or And then jumped off and pulled half of my drum set off the riser. And I finished the song. You finished I just made up fairly, shit. Yeah, you did, you did the kick parts on the top. Yeah, I was just making up stuff. Bob, thankfully, used his tom as a bass drum, and we made it through that song. And it was our first experience with having to get escorted by police to our van. Because it was just like New York City police officers having to keep fans back, and. You look out the window, you just saw people lining the yeah. streets and sharing Jumbo clothes. trons with Gerard's face on there. <laughs> like, uh, there was a taxi cab with like a Michael Grumman's like, ad on top. Yeah, it was, it was oh, dude. I felt like I was a Ghostbuster. That's famous. 
Ghostbuster fame. Yeah, Ghostbuster. <laughs> what was after that? Taste the Chaos was the next one. All right, you're on the Taste the Chaos tour right now. It's gonna be us, the used. The Chaos. Kill Switch Engage. Kill Switch Engage. A Static Lullaby. A Static Lullaby. I'm from the New Jersey. Sex is fail. What's your most memorable moment on Taste of Chaos? This moment right now. Right now. Because it's fresh in my memory. Shit of my chemical romance tattoo. Yeah, we're gonna check it out, dog. Alright, so how do you feel about what's going on over there with Danny Payne's tattoo? Six tats, bruh. <laughs> See what he's getting? A grenade with a banner that says revenge. And on top of the grenade it says NCR. <laughs> That looks fucking hot. How are you doing? I'm good, all right. Yeah? Frank, how do you feel about that? Too? I feel awesome, but I love this this Playgirl pose he's got going on, too. That's the best part, really, right? <laughs> I don't think the Taste of Chaos tour was as important to the band um, as that time period was, was important to the band, because that was really where everything crescendoed and kind of hit this point. <laughs> They really did go out there and kind of just show everybody why My Chemical Romance was going to be here to stay. How does it even feel? Is that strange? I saw you guys on TRL, it was so weird. It's, it's weird, dude. We don't really see how successful stuff is, you know? Yeah. We just hear about it, yeah. so. So you, so you know how many people are here tonight? How many? 7,500. 7,500, huh? A lot of people. Come on, Bob, you're ready. 10 minutes. All right, let's all go. So what you had was My Chemical Romance having commercial success happening and needing to go on stage every single night and show people why success was happening. Right. Yeah. That sexy beast. Bob Bryan. I can tell this band learned a lot because when they came in and did the used thing with them with uh, Under Pressure, Gerard, just the singing was so amazing. It was, holy cow. I mean, totally different singer. The guitar player, Ray, and Frank, and, 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 and everybody, the drummer is a new drummer. Tremendous drummer. They were so confident in here. They were, they were just confident, and they, I could feel it coming out of them that they had grabbed it by the teeth. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read your mind right now about what your favorite band is. My Chemical Romance. <laughs> what about the chicks and the drugs? No, nah, we're not, we're not into chicks and drugs. We, some of us may have been into a little bit of drugs beforehand. You know, there's this thing and that's rock and roll, and we're just so anti-rock and roll. Given some European interviews, we're like, so you guys get lots of groupies, and we're like, fuck you, man. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no show us your tits. No. Sign it, sign, sign it. Sign it. Great tour. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. Matt. Yeah. Oh, he's loving that. <laughs> <laughs> well, something had happened on Taste of Chaos where there was like a local band, and they, they were going. I think their record label pushed them to to go around with a video camera and get girls to show their tits for backstage passes. And not only that, that the video was going to also be seen by Mike Helga Romance. Let me fucking hear you holler! I sh shit. I lost my fucking cool. Um, 
and decided that that's what I was going to say on stage that night. If you ever see shitty ass rock dudes in shitty ass rock bands asking you to show them your tits for a backstage pass, I want you to spit right in their fucking face and yell, fuck you! Women being objectified and, and, and just so many bad things that are just inherent and ingrained in it that don't have to be that way. I just wanted to say hi. 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 I'm really excited to see you. How long have you been listening to My Chemical Romance? For like, ever. I've seen him 11 times. My eyes are swollen because all I wanted for my birthday was a picture with Gerard Way. Yeah. Very welcome. So you go to a My Chem show and like, there's not a groupie thing. Get off of me! There's no groupies, you know what I mean? We, we, that, that's the best part about My Chemical Romance fans. What's your name? Oh. Oh. Let me see the sign of it. Oh. Wow. Have you read the new Ellen Day Generous book yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How is it? How is it? it? Made me a lesbian. I don't like date girls now. I can't handle that. I need to have an open mind, my friend. All right, now for this song, I want to see your lighters and your cell phones up in the fucking air, please. All right, you guys do better than that. It's fucking New York. Everybody's got a cell phone. Now when the song starts, we're gonna sway them back and forth. This song is called The Ghost of You. I'm, I'm into lighters because that's tradition. Yeah, that's more. Cl that's it's, more. It's, it's modernizing it with these cell phones. I'm that's more big phones. hair rock. You it's, like the cell phones? It's brighter. Oh, well, that's true. It does look damn cool. I prefer lighters, but cell phones are the new lighter. This tour's been the best tour of my life. I'm going to miss it, man. I love touring with my cam. It's uh, probably my favorite band in the whole world to tour with, and like family. I'm actually, uh, I don't want to go to Europe, I'd rather stay here. And then they went to the UK. Scream for me, London! It's a great way to celebrate my birthday. I think uh, that's one of the main reasons I wanted to do um, two shows in one day. I, I thought it was a perfect day to do it in London on my birthday. It's kind of exciting, you know. Um, it's a great city with a lot of history, great kids. I feel like, I don't know, I'm not even tired. I definitely can do another. The band was playing two sold out shows in London at the Astoria, and the record company wanted to do this funeral procession and I have no idea why. I think they wanted to see if they could pull it off, and it was just insanity. You know, we've always said we wanted to be more theatrical, so it's actually like less of a stunt and more of, you know, it's an expression of like what's going on in the band, what's happening live, like how we want to become more, a more theatrical band. Like, there's this huge funeral procession that looks like it's from 1918, moving down the streets in London in the middle of a Saturday afternoon. And then the, the hearse died, and they had to physically push the hearse the rest of the way. I think in the fall when we find our headliner, we'll really be able to bring a lot more of those elements into it. Gerard said, let's look into what we can do to make it sure that as we're growing as a band, that our fans are getting their money's worth. We decided that we were going to reenact Helena in a live show. Yeah! Gerard wanted to see what it would be like to involve dancers because rock and roll has for the past five years, in our humbled opinions, become very boring and non-risky. And then um, hopefully we'll have production that we can bring with us and make it more theatrical, I think. That's the goal. 
the great thing about My Chemical Romance is, is that they're, they continually are pushing themselves to not do the same thing again. They're, they're just really creative guys, and, and I, I just have total faith that, like any great artist that has a long career, you see, you know, change uh, occur over time. Ghost of You video. Whew. Uh, Ghost of You. I had this idea where, like, fucking World War II. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, it has to be something and nobody's gonna expect. Yeah, he was like, it's gonna be World War II. We're gonna be soldiers. And he said, in the shit. He's like, we're gonna be in the shit. And I was like, man, that's so, like, just random thoughts pop out of his head all the time. That was one of them that was just genius, you know? And I was like, I'll even chop all my goddamn hair off. I don't care. And it's so it started to get excited about it. Yeah. I kind of suckered Mark into this too. Yeah. I was like, well, I'm thinking the next video is more like a movie and less like a video. Um, you think he could do World War II? And he's kind of sat there, and I was like, I'm, you know, and I'm like, I mean, like Saving Private Ryan. Can you recreate that? And he was like, Yeah, I think I can. And, and he did. He fucking did it real well. Too. He did. You know, so he got roped into it. Yeah. I'm you, sure. <laughs> You got everything down, yeah. like everything, the way it looked, like the depression of it. <laughs> oh, here's a, here's a little story. So we're on tour with Green Day. So I'm talking to Trey, I think, and he's like, yeah, we shot this video and we recreated um, the conflict in Iraq. It's like the, the war in Iraq, you know? It's like, it's, you know, it's just all war footage and stuff. And we were just like, oh, man, fuck, you know? <laughs> So I went to Billy a week later and I, I had the treatment or a couple days later and I said, look, I heard about your video, but we were going to make this video. He goes, why don't you sit with me and watch our video? So he sat me down, he showed me the video and I actually almost cried because it's really upsetting. It's a phenomenal video. But I was relieved because the videos are, are nothing alike. And the beauty of it though is they were making the same statement, this anti-war statement, you know. And it was cool because he kind of like gave us his blessing, was very happy that we were making a statement. When the band was on tour with Green Day, we started discussing the next record. And I said, okay, let's get another bus and rip the back half out of it. And you can put a studio in. And so what they do is spend most of their days back there writing new material. The bass. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, why'd you do? I think it's throwing you off. Way. I think it's throwing everything off. Like it's throwing stuff off. How about I just do this? Yeah, you can mute it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, that, just, I'll just do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you just want it so you can just record to the like to completely erase the program drums? Yes. I'm just afraid that sh that it's not gonna be able to record. Of course, is certain ones don't have vocals. We're gonna rock out, dude, big time. All right, that's a very excited guy. Ready? Production's great. The sound is great. Right. Fucking amazing. That that's supposed to be a double chorus. Okay. A singing? Yeah, not yeah, not yet, not yet. No vocals yet. Okay. Oh my god, that's a fucking amazing, you guys. That's amazing. And the production. Yeah. Ready, that's amazing production. This feels oh, dear, like a record. Thank you so much for that. I saw My Chemical Romance at Maxwell's in Hoboken. There's not a fucking chance in the world that any of us would have ever thought that they would be playing at Long Beach Arena and Round the Corner to receive gold records. Oh, 
actually get this. Thank you for fucking believing in us more than anybody else in the whole world. Thank you for making us the most dangerous band in rock and roll. <laughs> We're gonna make your label the most dangerous band. It's a dream at that point. You really live the dream. I wouldn't change anything for the world. Um, it's probably the greatest experience that anyone could ever have. I know I do this um, because I love playing music with the people that I get to play music with. There's no, there's no feeling in the world no better feeling in the world, I think, than being able to play on stage with these guys. If there were a movie made about your band, about your life, what would the story like be like in like, the ending? Even? I think the ending would be really good. And I think in the end, everybody would kind of go back to normal, doing what they do before the band, or maybe something new, like living in the woods, or like writing children's books, or Bob would be probably an airline pilot, or something. I'd like to think that when this band is through, like, everybody's lives would go back to normal and uh, not that we're not happy right now but like you know um, I'd like to think that everybody's gonna have a really good life when the band's done.